everyone. My name is Kendra Seymour, and I want to welcome you to another Change the Air Foundation interview. Now, today we're doing a healthy home makeover where we're going to make over four rooms, and we're going to discuss some of those actionable swaps and considerations that you can make so that your indoor environment can be a healthier one. Because the average American spends more than 90% of their time indoors, breathing in air that's potentially bad for your health. Change the Air Foundation, we want to help you make your indoor environment a healthier one. So to help us with that today, I'm so excited to introduce to you two amazing ladies who are going to take us through this journey. First, we have As Ashley Spanovich from Awakening Spaces and Amanda Bolden from Keto Canary. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, thank you, Kendra. I'm Ashley. Thank you, Kendra. Happy to be here. I'm Amanda. Yeah. And so I own a consulting and interior design company called Awakening Spaces, where I help people who are building or renovating their homes, create a safe space from the ground up and really focusing on ways we can prevent issues from happening in the first place, but then also how they can um, better live a non-toxic lifestyle in their home as well once they are in their space. And I'm Amanda, I'm founder of Keto Canary. I share low-carb, gluten-free recipes, clean beauty, and healthy lifestyle tips for everyday detox. Yeah, and we're really excited to be here. Amanda and I actually met on Instagram when I started Awakening Spaces. She's also a fellow interior designer, and we connected on healthy design issues and problems that we saw in the interior design industry. And we both have a health journey of our own that brought us to this experience understanding. So yeah, we're really excited to share more about this with you guys because it's a huge passion of ours. And um, we can both go ahead and share our health journeys, but I'll just start by saying that one of the things that brought me here and one of the reasons um, that I'm so passionate about healthy homes is I really started noticing a decline in my health after I graduated from college and I was working in interior design and um, it took me over five years of digging and trying to figure out what was going on to realize that a huge part of my struggle was from environmental toxins, mold, chemicals, heavy metals, and electromagnetic radiation. And so um, that's where I started studying building biology and building science and decided that I couldn't continue doing interior design the way that I had been doing it for the last 13 years. So I started Awakening Spaces to try to do things a little bit differently. And um, I've been battling my whole life with um, mystery illnesses, one after another, um, mainly neurological problems. And it wasn't until a couple years ago that I was completely disabled and we realized I was living in mold. And looking back, um, it's been environmental illnesses that have caused um, debilitating sickness throughout my life. So I started Keto Canary because I wanted to shed light on um, a very darkened illness that's often not discussed. Yeah. And I think that one really big common misconception, and many of you who are watching this probably already know, is that mold and toxin exposure is not just an allergy, um, as a lot of people might think. I think me and Amanda share the neurological side of things, which was the most scary for me um, and was very long lasting. So um, yeah, do you wanna share a little, Amanda, about like how we're actually exposed to these different toxins? Yeah, so we are exposed in our everyday life um, through ingestion, absorption, inhalation, and injection. Um, we live in a toxic world, and we are exposed. We're exposed daily, so it's it's very important to um, detox daily and do as much as you can to practice avoidance. Um, Ashley, do you want to give a little bit more detail about that? Yeah, so you know, when it comes to ingestion, this could be eating food that's contaminated with mold, or this could even be um, having mold spores and toxins living in our dust and, um, you know, touching it with our hands and putting our hands in our mouths. This is especially important for little ones who might be crawling around on our floors. And um, 
you know, there's different products and things we can be putting on our skin that is now we are absorbing those toxins through our skin, um, inhalation. If we're kicking up that dust, we're breathing it in. Um, I think that's the most common one we're all very you know aware of is how we can be inhaling these different things and off gassing and chemicals from our products. Um, and then there's like injection even from, you know, vaccines and different th things like that, or other medications that might have additives to them. So I'm going to go ahead and share, let's get, so, um, yeah, so we kind of already explained why it matters to us and why we feel like this is really important to make conscious decisions. So we're going to go ahead and share, um, one of the biggest and easiest things that we think, um, everyone can do today. If you're not already doing it to, um, have a better, healthier indoor environment. And I'll let Amanda take it away on this one. So this is our cleaning guide. It's a quick swap guide we put together for you. It's a really easy place to get started. Um, it's contradictory to be removing toxins from our home using toxic products. So we just put together a quick swap guide. Um, we have all purpose general cleaners, glass cleaners, soap, disinfectant cleaners, abrasive cleaners, and detergents. Um, oftentimes, a lot of these products are um, filled with fragrances or other chemical components that um, we really don't have enough info on and are harmful to our health. Uh, hopefully, this is like an easy, quick, great place for you to get started in making cleaner, healthier choices. Yeah. And in addition, like we have so many products that we have a bottle for each thing we're trying to clean. We really don't need all those different things. Really just soap and water will get the job done. So we really encourage you to look through your cabinets and your cupboards and see what kind of cleaning products you have and what you're using and reading the ingredients on it. If you can't or you don't understand what these ingredients are, or if they have a really long laundry list of ingredients, you know, we encourage you to see if you can find something more simpler and more uh, minimalist. Um, and really just using a soap, like we're showing Bronner Sal Suds here, Branch Basics uh, All-Purpose Concentrate is another really, really amazing all-purpose put hot water in a bucket, throw a little cap of that in there with a microfiber cloth, and you can clean pretty much everything. So, yeah, we just, um, we wanted to share this to give you a place to start in case it's not something that you're already doing. It's a really easy first step in um, creating a healthier indoor environment. You know what I love about this is I think, I don't know about you, like when I was growing up, like clean always had a smell. And I think we have to like break that idea. Clean should not have an odor, right? Mm -hmm. I once, I read recently, it was talking about how fragrance is the new like secondhand smoke which yeah. is like really powerful. Like I grew up in the eighties and I remember walking to a restaurant and, and you could smell the smoke from the smoking section and, and everything. And now that you think about it, um, at least in my own journey, I know I've become more sensitive to, um, various odors and things like that. And your cleaning products put off those irritants, those VOCs. And I love that like vinegar is so cheap and soap and water. Like it, it doesn't require this like magical potion. So I, I love those tips. Those are great. Thank you. Yeah. It's so funny. Once you start to actually remove all the fragrances from your life, and we'll talk more about those, um, in the, in further slides, but once you start to remove those fragrances and scents from your life, you become even more sensitive to them now. Like if I smelled Windex today, I, yeah, <laughs> I couldn't handle it. <laughs> Knock you over. Absolutely. Okay. When I move to the next slide here. So so yeah, so we are going to talk a little bit um, throughout the presentation, we're really going to be going over four main rooms to kind of give an overview of the things that you can look for um, in your home and start to identify ways to make your home a healthier place. So um, the first room we're going to talk about is the living room. And within this room, we're going to cover furniture, decor, paints, flooring, and this is kind of used as a catch-all room for just the general home. Um, and then we are going to go ahead and talk about the bathroom. 
um, where we think this room deserves some special attention just because it's one of the wettest areas of the, of the home and has a lot of moisture and where moisture is mold can follow. Um, then we're going to talk on the kitchen. Um, again, another wet area of the home, but also it's where our food is in the home. It's, we have cookware, we have storage containers, our refrigerator, um, ventilation. There's lots of things we're going to talk about in the kitchen. Uh, and then the bedroom, we're going to talk about the bedroom because we believe that this is probably the room in the home that needs to be the healthiest because that's where we are sleeping and repairing every night. So we will kind of jump in here and start talking about the living room. So Amanda, do you want to talk a little bit about um, where we should start in the living room? Yeah, so a really easy way to start um, in the living room would be regular dusting, regular cleaning. Um, managing your dust is a very important aspect of a healthy home. Um, our dust essentially is mold spores, bacteria, dust mites, and other toxins that clump together and are known as dust. I really didn't recognize that until recently. Um, and it's, it's super important to get that out of there because it's what you're breathing. It's what you're inhaling throughout the day. Um, we recommend using a microfiber cleaning cloth and a surfactant based detergent soap, like the Bronner's that we mentioned before. Um, I personally, I clean everything with soap and water. It's, it's so easy and it really gets the job done. Um, another important, uh, aspect of your living room, which really your entire house, um, our shoes off at the entryway. And Ashley, I know you've said a really great thing before about the doorway. So I kind of want you to explain that. Yeah. So I always say like we have our home HVAC filter, but the biggest filter that we have in our home is our front door. So we really just need to kind of create this new consciousness of saying, um, what we're going to allow to bring into our home. And part of that is what's coming in on our shoes. Um, not only the things that we choose to bring into our home, every piece of furniture, every piece of decor, every piece of clothing, food, everything, we have an opportunity to say whether or not we should bring that or allow that into our home. Um, and so, you know, use your door as your biggest filter and you filter every single thing that comes through that door. And shoes number one, because shoes can bring in the bacteria, the mold, the feces. I mean, a lot of really gross things that come from outside oil, um, from cars and different things and gum. And, and then not to mention your shoes can also damage your finishes and your furnishings. So it's really, you know, wearing, uh, making a no shoe policy, we think is like a really, really big important thing and an easy thing you can do to start um, limiting the things that you're bringing to your home. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Like your, your doorway is your filter to your entire home, whatever you're bringing in, um, be conscious of, of what you're bringing through your doorway, uh, mm -hmm. candles and fragrance. So this is an easy one. Just stop using them. Um, as Kendra said, fragrance is the new secondhand smoke. Um, I know that I'm super sensitive and I completely react and have an inflammatory spiral. Um, I just, I feel like it's very easy now to have alternatives. Like they have the flameless candles. Um, you know, you can hang twinkling lights. You can kind of create that coziness without the, um, the harmful chemicals that are released through candles and fragrance. That also goes for like, um, any kind of spray, uh, deodorizer, um, Lysol. I'm not sure what some of these have are called, but you know what I'm talking about? The sprays Breeze. that you spray for breeze, the, the sprays that you spray in your home to cover up other smells. Like it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, and I want to add to that. If you smell other smells in your home, why are we masking those? Right. We have to really think about why we might be smelling an odor in our home. And instead of masking it, we need to try to get to the root cause of the problem. Oftentimes it could be um, MVOCs from microbial growth. It could be, um, you know, that could be, sometimes there's a smell of urine from wet insulation. Um, our smells can be indicators that there's other things going on in our home. So 
Um, rather than trying to cover them up, it's important to try to get to the root of that. That's a great one. And that, that reminds me of like, our home is like our body. I don't, don't cover up, you know, yeah. the, the issues, but get to the root cause, like really figure out what's going on. Exactly. Um, you want to chat a little bit about relative humidity and moisture management? Yeah. So in addition to just having clean air, um, one of the most important things that we can do for our home is managing the moisture that's in our home. So get into the habit of monitoring your moisture. Um, I think everyone should have a hygrometer in their home where they actually place them in various locations. And I always have one in all the wet locations of the home. And you can make sure that your home is between 30 and 45%. You might see that changing from place to place, but that is what I recommend is between 30 and 45% relative humidity as a safe spot um, to know that uh, the, the moisture levels are balanced in the home. Um, and if you are going over that number, then you might need to look into why. You might need to look into investing in a dehumidifier dehumidifier um, and really trying to bring those levels back into balance. Um, there's a lot of different things that we can do when we're renovating or building to sort of build that um, into a new home or into a construction. But if you are just working with a home that you're already in, then dehumidification is going to be um, really important there. But knowing when you need to do that or when you need to provide supplemental humidification, because when we start to get below 30% relative humidity, we can start to have health issues as well. I'm in Denver, Colorado. It's very dry here. And in the winter times, it can get down to 10% relative humidity. And I can feel it in my skin, can feel it in my sinuses. I can feel it in my chest and it kind of makes me want to cough. And I don't feel well in that either. So um, I know oftentimes when we come from a, an experience with mold, we're like, we just want no humidity at all. And so we are just, I think oftentimes don't realize that sometimes too low of humidity can also create issues. Yeah, absolutely. And then once you get your humidity in check, um, purifying and cleaning your air, there are a lot of great air filters right now out there. Um, the list actually is much longer than what we have time for. Um, but kind of finding a machine that filters down to about 0.03 microns is going to be good. If you want like a cheap place to get started, um, you can always take a HEPA filter and kind of tape it on the box, uh, on the back of a box fan and kind of run that. Um, another tip that personally my doctor gave me is to have air filtration throughout your home by just opening and cracking windows. It's not the best for your energy bill, but it does get that air recirculating and uh, get fresh airflow into your home. Um, anything else you wanna add about air filter or like purifying the air? I know there just are, there's a ton of different yeah. products. Yeah, I think people always ask what's the best filter. And honestly, I think any filter is gonna be better than no filter um, to some extent, just, um, having something in place where you can filter your air um, and just making sure that you're also in addition to that, keeping up with a really, really good practice of cleaning regularly, um, cleaning schedule, make sure that you're managing the dust and that you have an air filter that can be helping you with anything that's left over. It's going to be really, really helpful. So don't get too caught up in the weeds of what's the best, or I can't afford this. Um, but really just trying to find something that filters down, um, to the 0 0.03 microns, and then um, just keeping up with that cleaning schedule. And that will really, really help improve the indoor air. I'll jump in just for a moment because we actually just released a um, episode. I did an interview with Carl Grimes, who has a long history with indoor air quality, and it's all about air purification. So you can check that out at changetheairfoundation.org if people want to dig a little deeper into that. But you're right. it's it's People get bogged down in some of the unimportant details. Um, and, and that can be hard. Sorry, mm -hmm. didn't mean to cut off your flow. You're good. Oh, that's perfect. I can't wait to listen to that. Um, but yeah, so, you know, in addition to air purification, kind of going back to this list that we have here, um, DIY or home renovation product or projects. So 
you know, just if you are planning to do any DIY or renovation pro projects, just knowing that every single thing that you would be considering to use on those projects could contain different toxins. And, you know, there are definitely cleaner options out there and there's a lot more things today than there ever was before. So really being conscious of that. Um, and that's where Amanda and I, you know, you can always reach out to us if you are doing a home renovation project and knowing what to look for. Um, we're really both, you know, trying to help our clients find lower VOC products, cleaner products, and just finding ways that um, we can improve the health of our home through all of the materials we're bringing into our home. I think we can all relate to knowing when you paint the walls and you get dizzy and headaches from the odor and the smell, um, or when you buy a piece of new furniture and you also have that off-gassing smell, and that's going to segue into furniture. Amanda, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So again, your door is your gateway into your home and be mindful of anything you bring into it, um, especially uh, upholstered furniture. So it's often filled with tons of unwanted chemicals. Um, there are petroleum based foams. Uh, you try to avoid those at all costs. One recommendation is whatever you're bringing into your home, let it sit in your garage, let it sit outside for a couple of days, uh, weeks, let it off gas. And while that's not going to eliminate it completely, it's going to be helpful, especially if you're extremely sensitive. Um, but again, you can always reach out to us and we can chat about safer, cleaner, um, products and right along with upholstered furniture, the same materials would be rugs and draperies, Ashley, if you want to touch on that. Yeah. Uh, fabrics and the actual, um, cushioning in the fabrics. Um, these things, you know, we have these performance fabrics so that they don't wrinkle and they lay right and they prevent them from fading and they're treated treated for stain resistance, but all of these things are additional chemicals that we're bringing into our home that can um, deteriorate over time. And then that stuff winds up in our dust and through our dust, we're either ingesting that if it's a baby walking around on their hands and knees, or we're breathing it in from VOCs um, or whatever might be um, in SVOCs. So SVOCs are essentially um, the toxins that wind up in our dust from our different products that have been degraded. So, um, it's just really important to look at if you're going to be bringing rugs in, um, or draperies in to look at how are they treated and looking at finding things that are made of natural materials is going to be best. Um, not only from a toxin perspective, but, um, if you think about, um, if you're ever in a home and you get, uh, like you're feeling a lot of static electricity that can often be from using synthetic materials and fabrics in our home. And it really, um, it, it does something to our electroclimate and it puts it out of balance. And so we'll start to feel, you know, we might flip a light switch and we get an electric shock or we're walking around on our carpet and we get electric shocks. So um, using natural materials is going to prevent that from happening just as well as, you know, providing an overall healthier environment. Before you go on, can I, can I ask a quick question? So if I'm, if I'm looking to buy furniture or rugs, is, is there any kind of like label or certification that I'm looking for to kind of help the consumer, like decide what might be a better option? Is there anything out there? Yeah, there are, Amanda, you were shaking your head. Did you have, want to say something? Um, no, I kind of, I think that you know a couple of labels that are really good to look for. Yeah. So, well, all, I think always looking for a natural material, um, looking for organic, um, an Okio, an Okio Tech standard certification is going to be, um, they've done the testing to know whether or not there's chemicals used in the manufacturing process of that. I think that's a really great option. And what I found too, um, is you can find that standard on a lot more things in bigger box stores. So if you go to target, for instance, a lot of their, um, linens and fabrics and blankets and sheets and towels will have that standard on there, which is, I think, really great and makes it way more accessible to the everyday consumer. I agree. I think Green Guard's another one that they're starting to really use in the bigger stores, West Elm and 
um, I believe a couple of others. So we're, we're getting there, but yeah, those certifications are super easy to look for. And, um, again, like Ashley said, choosing natural, um, products and reading your labels, just like you would read, um, food, like what's this made out of just being curious. Yeah. Yeah. And in addition to, if you're looking for upholstered furniture, you're looking for things that um, do not have flame retardants in them is going to be a really, really big, mm -hmm. big one too. That's a good one. Yeah. Especially mattresses. I mean, how we're spending most of our time on a mattress, breathing that in, we spend how many hours um, a day, at least eight to 10 hours on our mattress, breathing in those fumes. So super important. Um, which takes us to interior finishes, um, VOCs, everything that we use is off gassing your paints, your grouts, your flooring adhesives, uh, your flooring materials. So, um, I know paint is a, um, topic I'm passionate about, but making sure that you're using low VOC or no VOC paints, you're opening your windows, you're getting the air circulating, um, Another easy, like simple trick is to put baking soda throughout your house. Just open up the boxes. It'll kind of absorb um, the odors. That's a super economical way to get started. But choosing low VOC, no VOC products. And I know that they're getting better now. I know at the beginning, like they weren't as quality as, you know, your standard paint. Um, but we're getting there and choosing those um, products is super important to just avoid, avoid the toxins. Yeah. All right. So that is the living room and sort of like the general overview of things to look for in your entire home. Um, but let's move on to the bathroom because the bathroom is one of the locations of the home with the highest humidity. It's considered a wet location along with the kitchen, which we'll also be talking about. Um, and it's so, so important to be monitoring the humidity, um, in this location. And you want to make sure that you're doing whatever you can to keep it dry. And not to mention, uh, we're going to go deep into products because Amanda is the products queen, um, the clean product queen, but that is something that we keep in our bathrooms oftentimes. So we're going to touch on the, you know, beauty, the beauty and personal care items that we're also putting on our bodies. Um, but going back to keeping it dry, and we talked a lot about this already um, in the living room area, but it's important to monitor the areas that have plum plumbing to them. So the sinks, the toilets, the showers, you want to make sure there's not any leaks or cracks that might be allowing water to get in. Um, if you are taking a shower, you're inherently raising the humidity of that room. There's going to be a lot of moisture in the air. So making sure that when your shower is over and during your shower, you're running the exhaust fan and you kind of have to be a little careful about this. You want to make sure that your exhaust fan isn't venting into your attic or something like that. If you live in an older home, um, but that it's, it's venting out of the home. Um, and you want to make sure that after a certain amount of time that your relative humidity is dropping back into that optimal range of 30 to 45%. Um, be uh, another caution about pulling air out of our homes. We do want to be careful as we're pulling too much air out of our homes that we maybe crack a window or a door or something um, so that we can keep the pressure of the home balanced and we're not drawing too much air out of the home because if we're drawing too much air out of the home, we could be drawing in air into the home from cracks in the walls, outlet plugs, um, through baseboards, different things like that. So by opening um, a door or window, we know that as we're pulling air out of um, moist air out of the home, we're also bringing in fresh air. And this is always a good thing to know if we don't have a fresh air intake in your home. Um, but yeah, so you know, making sure that after you're showering too, you are squeegeeing your walls down and trying to get the bulk amount of moisture into the drains. That's really going to help the bathroom dry a lot quicker. And, um, you know, you can also go as far as actually taking a towel and drying the walls down. Sometimes that's what I do. Um, you know, after I squeegee, I'll actually dry the walls down. So it really just depends on how far you want to take it, but, <laughs> um, keeping the bathroom dry is super, super, super important. 
Hey, even my kids know how to squeegee it. And honestly, when I first showed them, it was like their favorite thing to do. I think they wanted to take a shower <laughs> so they could squeegee. So, and they're cheap too. Like squeegees aren't expensive and it, it's a great preventative tool that doesn't cost you much in what, 60 seconds of time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And it's like good exercise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's right. I love that. Um, and then regular cleaning, which we've already discussed, um, regular cleaning throughout your house, but especially in your bathroom, um, drains, and we have drains in our kitchen and our bathroom, but they're a great place for bacteria and mold to grow. Um, so once a week, I like to take baking soda with vinegar, which might also be fun for kids. I, I don't know if I'd have them do this, but um, it's it's really cool to see that chemical reaction. I mean, it fizzes and it's a great natural Drano. So making sure that we are um, cleaning our drains regularly is an important one. Um, bath mats, towels, shower curtains, um, avoid hanging those against the wall, especially if they are wet. Um, so also another habit that I know a lot of people have is when they take a shower and they, they come out of the shower and they open the curtain, they'll keep it closed. Well, that's another great place for moisture, um, and bacteria to grow. So making sure that that is open and drying out. Um, we mentioned wiping down the bath. Uh, walls after you're done showering, squeegeeing, um, washing your bath mats regularly. Those, if they aren't bath mats, are a really good place for mold and bacteria to grow. Um, they have the bath stones now uh, that are great alternatives to mats in general, and you don't have to worry about like washing those regularly. Anything else we have to add about the bathroom? I will say, I'm glad you brought up the bath mats because I've actually seen pictures of people where mold had been growing underneath the bath mats, mm -hmm. you know, it's with, from time um, passing and so many people showering and that moisture eventually getting through for whatever reason. And they lifted it up and there was mold growing. So, you know, another added benefit to washing them is you can check underneath to make sure that, you know, you don't have any standing water that's, you know, sitting around for too long. Yeah. yeah. And that goes for hanging the towels on the wall too. Cause if you have a really wet towel and it's hanging up on the wall, I mean, our dry, our drywall is essentially made out of paper. So if it's not getting a lot of airflow around that, you can get some, some funky discoloration at the wall too. And you can start to notice that if you look or you, um, flash a flashlight on it, you can usually start to see some of the water drippings on the wall. And you can kind of, if you look off to the side a little bit, you can start to see that. And it's so, it's not something we think about all the time. So where do you hang your, your bath towel? Do you get a new one each time? Do you put it in your laundry basket? Does it go right into the washing or a dish, not dishwasher, excuse me, washing machine? Yeah, I have a, um, on a, I have a frameless glass panel that has a hook. So I will hang it there. Um, or we have, um, we actually have like a clothes hanger that we'll like flip our bath mat over. And sometimes our towel, it's where we dry our clothes when we're, we don't want to put them in the dryer as well, but we will sometimes use that or my partner will sometimes flip it over the door, which drives me nuts, but at least it's not on the <laughs> wall. <laughs> so. uh, I saw something really funny recently, but it works great. So, you know, we squeegee our bathroom walls, but squeegee yourself. So after you're done showering, kind of like wipe, yourself down and then dry off and your towel gets like way less wet so that's just it works really well it sounds funny but it's a really good, a really good tool <laughs> yeah give yourself a shake before you get out yeah. <laughs> personal care items amanda take it away all right so this is my bread and butter um, being that our skin is our largest organ, um, it's super important to pay attention to what you're putting on it. What you're putting on your body is getting absorbed inside of you. And just like you are what you eat, like you are what you use. Um, lots and lots of chemicals are added to personal care and beauty products, including fragrance. Um, there is little to no regulation in the industry, and it's super important to pay attention to what you're using. Read the labels. Um, go to, we mentioned the EWG.org Skin Deep. Search your products. They are a um, non-for-profit who is 
researching um, these chemicals, if they're good for us, if they're bad for us, if they're safe for us. So I always use them. And there's a couple other ones as well. I know, Ashley, you've mentioned a couple other resources. Um, My favorite is Switch Naturel right now. I just absolutely love hers. And I think she has a couple of chemicals in there that aren't listed out on some of the other apps too. So um, that's another great place, another great app to use if you're wanting to look for cleaner products. Okay. I love that. And I mean, just educate yourself. You have to be, um, you know, your own advocate for your health. Um, there's a lot of hormone disrupting chemicals. There's just, and we're starting to see it in the news now to where, um, larger companies that are being called out for using these unsafe products. And I think that's really cool and really exciting. Um, so I'll kind of chat about clean beauty, makeup, skincare, shampoo, body wash, deodorant. Um, we, like Ashley said, we like to research and make sure that we're using safe products. Um, I personally, uh, use beauty counter. I'm a consultant for them and all their products are safe. They're EWG certified. Um, they have, I believe over 2000 chemicals that they won't use that we in the United States uses, um, which kind of blows my mind because other countries, they have laws and regulations and there are lots of, you know, chemicals on the do not use list. However, here in the States, we kind of don't have any rules or regulations. Um, Deodorant is one of my favorite easy, quick swaps. So your deodorant has uh, typically aluminum in it to make you stop sweating. It clogs up your pores as we all know like that's a super important part of our detox our detox pathway you know relies on being able to sweat and get rid of some of the bad stuff so that would be my first place to say if you want to start switching to cleaner products switch your deodorant um that that was my first place to do that because it's just it's it's an easy one and it's super important um ashley do you want to touch on oral care Yeah. Oral care. I mean, so much of our health begins in our mouth. If you think about it, it's the very beginning of our digestive tract. Um, So we definitely recommend, recommend finding a cleaner toothpaste brand. And um, one that I've really been liking is Boca. It has the um, remineralizing hydroxy appetite, which replaces fluoride. Um, My dentist also started giving away one called Risewell that also has the hydroxy appetite. Um, you know, so looking at that and then also looking at our floss, this is a really sneaky place for PFAs to live, which are forever chemicals that stay in our body for a really long time. They don't break down. So I think, um, yeah, it's really important to, to be considering that area, especially because of how close of contact it is to our inside of our bodies. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, some other alternatives. I know um, baking soda can often be abrasive, but if you mix it with coconut oil, um, there are just really great cleaner ways um, than the standard, you know, toothpaste um, with the fluoride. Uh, perfumes, body sprays. Uh, I always like to preach that the best method of detoxification is avoidance. Um, these, you know, have horrible chemicals in them that often trigger an inflammatory response. And especially for people who are super sensitive, like the best solution would be just, just to avoid those. And they're added in everything. Like they are added in your foundation fragrance is added in your hair care. It's added in your deodorant. It's added in your body wash. You just have to be very aware and conscious of what you're putting on your skin and in your body, because again, you absorb it. And that is, um, you know, contributing to your health and wellness. Yeah. Um, let's go ahead. If you don't have anything else, Amanda, and we can move to the kitchen. Yeah. All right. The kitchen, um, this is another wet location of our homes and it's wet because we have a sink in there. We have a dishwasher in there. We may have a plumbing line to the refrigerator in there. And so it's really important to be monitoring this area, Uh, not to mention we're also cooking in there, you know, maybe we're boiling water and um, that humidity is then getting into the air. So it's a, it's a high humidity area, which is why we call it a wet area. 
Um, and it's important to, to be monitoring this area often. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But one of the things that is really big that we bring into our kitchens is just the things that we're using. Amanda, do you want to talk a little bit about the non-toxic cookware and storage containers? Yeah. So you mentioned forever chemicals, PFAs. Those are often found in non-toxic cookware. Um, and when heating to a certain temperature, they vaporize, you're inhaling them. Um, obviously, you're cooking your food in there, so you're ingesting them. Um, a lot of these coatings make it easier for us to cook because they're nonstick, um, but ultimately they just contribute to um, disease versus versus wellness. So again, the best method is avoidance. Choose non-toxic cookware. There are a lot of options out there um, and it's just, it's, it's getting better. Also be careful of what you're storing your um, food in, you know, glass containers, what you're drinking out of, uh, your drinking glass, all the plastics, um, a super simple ways, like choose to drink out of a glass jar when you're at home. Um, what else is there when you're, obviously we all know the microwave, it's not the greatest, you know, thing for any of our health. Um, but making sure that you aren't taking plastic and microwaving in it. Um, I know that I worked in Chicago a couple, you know, a decade ago and, um, I got called out for that. I just didn't realize it. A lot of people just don't realize you should not uh, be using these products. So again, just bringing awareness to it. Um, the dishwasher can often be scary for people, but I don't think it has to be. So Ashley, do you want to touch on uh, dishwasher maintenance? Yeah. So dishwashers, you really need to be inspected often and cleaned often. Um, a lot of people choose not to even use them at all because they're worried about um, the amount of water and bacteria and things that they harbor. But I think that if you are going to use a dishwasher, it's important to try to monitor it often, make sure all of the seals are clean and in, they're intact and all of the spinning components and things are all working and are all intact and it's draining properly. Um, and then, you know, there's certain ones that you can buy that have an automatic, um, water shut off if there is a leak. So putting those little pieces of insurance in place can make it a safer thing to use. But definitely if you um, are new to all of this, making sure that you're inspecting around your dishwasher for leaks and um, just grime and bacteria and mold that might be living in the nooks and crannies of it is really, really important for your health. Um, and we, you know, and ventilation too. So cooking, we talked about, um, if you're using like a nonstick cookware, um, as you're heating that up, it can aerosolize. So one really important thing to do is to make sure you are getting ample ventilation. If you're not going to stop using those things, make sure you are getting ample ventilation in your kitchen. Um, not to mention as we cook our food combusts into these really small micro particles that we can breathe in and that can be bad for us as well. Um, and you know, gas stoves and gas, gas appliances as well, um, bring combustion gases into our homes that can be dangerous to breathe in as well. So anytime I really say anytime you're cooking or using your stove, it's important to be using your kitchen ventilation. And as I mentioned earlier, when you are ventilating, if you don't already have makeup air coming into your home, make sure you crack a little window or something, or if you can, just so you have a little bit of fresh air that can come in as you're pulling air out of the home. Um, but ventilation is going to help with um, getting any of those toxic gases out, as well as taking out any moisture that might be coming from the food that you're cooking, depending on what you're cooking. Um, so that's a really, really important component of a healthy, having healthy indoor air, especially in our kitchen. And the refrigerator is a super important um, component as well. And, you know, Amanda's going to talk a little bit about that and also the food that we bring into it. So do you want to share a little bit more on that? Yes. Like everything else, we advise that you clean it regularly, um, weekly, just to make sure that you are maintaining your refrigerator. Um, but also super important to take inventory, take inventory of your food, the expiration dates, um, how things are looking, um, super great place for mold to, uh, 
grow on your cheeses, on your produce, um, making sure that everything's fresh, clean, and um, healthy in there. Uh, going back to the sinks, um, weekly cleaning, uh, garbage disposals are another great uh, area that are, um, you know, constantly wet. It's dark, great place for moisture to hang out for mold to start growing. So um, again, we suggest that baking soda, vinegar solution, um, and actually like opening up the garbage disposal and seeing, you know, what remnants are in there and kind of digging them out and, and throwing those away. Yeah. And we actually have a slide. So we, we kind of jumped over the sink. I jumped over the sink there, but we actually have more on the refrigerator here. So Amanda, if you want to share a little bit more while we're on this slide. Sure. So um, this is more about foods and um, we'll get into light and we'll get into water filtration. Um, but the foods that are inside of your refrigerator. So uh, as most of us know, our foods are heavily sprayed with pesticides. Um, it, it's super important to just choose organic as much as possible. The best method of detoxification is avoidance. Um, organic has less pesticides, less toxins, and it's actually higher in nutrients as well. So you'll be getting more vitamins, more minerals. Um, also choosing grass-fed meats. Um, they're also, again, higher in nutrients. They're raised without antibiotics, um, which obviously leads to antibiotic resistance in humans, but just making better decisions. So I believe it's the EWG. They have that top 15 dirty, dirty, I think it's dirty dozen clean 15. Uh, so if you don't have the budget to choose all organic, it tells you the top foods that you should be choosing organic and those that you could kind of get away with. Like I believe an avocado has a really thick skin. So they're going to spray those pesticides and it's not going to completely absorb into what you're eating. Um, so that's a great place to start. Um, Let's see what's next. How about water filtration? Yeah. I mean, clean water is so essential to human health and it's so sad. Um, we were just talking about traveling and, and um, I was just recently in Austria and the water was so clean there and you don't have to worry about a lot of the things that we have to worry about here in the United States. Um, you know, even in some of the areas where people say, oh, the water's clean, I would really highly recommend everyone testing their water before drinking um, the tap water just to make sure, because I know that um, I lived in a really cute little mountain town in the foothills in Colorado in golden Colorado, and there was birth control found in my water. Mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, not only birth control, but pesticides, there's all different types of pharmaceuticals and um, chemicals that can be found in the water and not to mention the, um, chlorine and chloramines from the filtration process itself. Um, so I think making sure you have a water filter and again, same with the air filters, you know, you don't have to go out and buy the most expensive thing. Most of the time, any filter is going to be better than no filter, but I do recommend testing because there are some filters that are going to be better and filter out certain things that other filters don't. Um, you know, there's, um, reverse osmosis is going to be something that filters and cleans a really broad range of chemicals. However, a lot of people might say it's removing the minerals out of your water. So you really need to make sure that you're upping your mineral intake elsewhere. Um, but again, you can go to, um, my tap score and you can actually get a water test and test your water to see what's in there. And so that, you know, which kind of filter you need to actually remove the contaminants in your specific water. Um, but in terms of the refrigerator, the water filtration, the, the lines of your um, water filter in your refrigerator can become contaminated with mold. So it's really important to look at the refrigerator's manufacturer recommendations and see how you can clean it because, um, and I know this is something I didn't know, you actually are supposed to maintain the water lines and clean them regularly. Um, so if you are using that as your water filtration, make sure you're cleaning the lines and you're following the recommendations from the manufacturer of your refrigerator to do that. Um, 
And then, you know, talking a little bit, we can kind of talk a little bit about blue light. Um, uh, so blue light is a type of visible light that has shorter wavelengths and higher energy than other colors of light. And when we you know, are exposed to this in the daytime that can have positive effects on our mood and attention and alertness. Um, blue light is what can come from the sun, but blue light at night can have negative effects on our health. Um, blue light in the evening can disrupt our circadian rhythm, which is our body's internal clock. And it can tell our hormones to stop producing melatonin, which makes us sleepy, um, which can disrupt our sleep. Um, and one area that a couple of areas in our kitchen that have blue light that we might not know or think about are in our refrigerators. Oftentimes we have a light in there. So just be conscious that when you're reaching and opening the refrigerator after dark, that you are going to be getting exposed to some blue light there, as well as some, you know, maybe from whatever clocks or um, other ele electronics you have, even our lights can contain blue light. So just something to be conscious about if you're feeling like um, you're struggling with your sleep, um, blue light could be a component in that. And one place that you can find that is in your refrigerator. I love that if I can jump in for just a second that you guys are focusing on the refrigerator because there really are um, like a number of areas like you alluded to, like the, the water dispenser and your ice maker. Um, it's also prime place. Uh, if you haven't to pull out your refrigerator carefully, especially if you have a water line, because you want to check behind there, the number of times I've seen um, slow drips and mold growing behind there is large. And then underneath your refrigerator, there's a drip pan that most people don't realize that um, mm -hmm. because of the cooling mechanisms allows water and things like that can to condense and, you know, as dust and other things settle in there can be a prime source. So I love that you guys, um, you know, are focusing on the refrigerator because it's, it's not one that people think about too often. Yeah. And if you are, you know, it's accessing those different areas and, you know, the coils and the drip pans and all that might be different for everybody's refrigerator. So I always lean really heavily on looking at the, the recommendations and the manufacturer, the, the, sorry, the owner's manual yeah. of whatever refrigerator you have. If you don't have that, um, then you can go online and put in the make and model of your refrigerator. And you can likely find something online that says how you need to be taking care of your refrigerator. I think oftentimes we think that we don't have to do anything to these things. They're just bulletproof. Cause I don't know, we never did anything, um, yeah. but there's the manufacturer actually does have requirements for how to properly care and maintain for these things. So I'm, I am betting that there's somebody out there listening. I didn't, I, we don't use our water line. And so I, I wouldn't think to clean it, but I know how I had in the past in places I rented and never once thought about it. And it's similar mm -hmm. to your dishwasher. I, I know we talked about that and you talked in the previous slide, but I don't know. I, I, I did not know this until I was embarrassingly old. I won't tell you how old, but I, I didn't realize that inside my dishwasher, I was supposed to pull out the bottom rack and pull up. And there's a filter there that you're mm -hmm. supposed to pull out and clean. And if you haven't done it, glove <laughs> up, make mask up and do it because you will be grossed out. Um, but you're yeah. supposed to be cleaning that for us. It's weekly. There are certain dishwashers, um, that don't have that component. They have a, a grinding mechanism that, that helps catch, but all, all that like food debris will settle on that filter. So if you haven't, and you're brave tonight, pull out your bottom rack and, and pull up that filter. It usually unscrews again, you can look for the owner's manual, um, for how to clean it, but that's one of those things, you know, no one necessarily tells you, you need to be checking for. So I love, I love all those tips. Those are great. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I think Amanda already kind of touched on this, but we didn't specifically talk about this, but just making sure the food inside of the refrigerator is not moldy. You're cleaning that out weekly. You're not letting things sit for too long. Um, they, that can alone can be a huge source of toxins in the home. All right. Um, do you want to talk a little bit? We kind of already talked about this, um, but is there anything else you want to add to, on making healthy food choices? We kind of already talked about it, but, um, you know, food is energy and it's kind of crazy to have to say, but just choose real foods. Um, one of the things I like to say is when you're in the grocery store, shop around the perimeter. 
what's around the perimeter. You have your produce, you have your butcher, you have your real fresh foods. It's the middle aisles that kind of get you into the process. I call them Franken foods. Of course, you know, everyone uses some here to there, but choose whole real foods. Um, I'm obviously a big promoter of low carb and paleo, um, but just eating naturally and eating for your health, eating for your energy levels. Um, just, you know, like, what we're worried about in the air, breathing in, uh, ingestion is a big part too. So I think overall, just read ingredient labels, stay away from processed foods. Um, you can obviously reach out to me. I have lots of um, recipes and tips and all of the above. So yeah, you do like a weekly email list helping people shop, don't you? I do. I was doing a weekly meal plan and now I'm doing um, weekly recipes, but the goal is for you to have a really big arsenal to just pull from of breakfast, lunch, dinner um, items that are, that are good for you and good for your body, your health and healing. Yeah. I love that. I think that's really helpful. And I think that, you know, for me personally, so much when my health, when I realized that environmental toxins are playing a role in my health, it became the front runner of importance for me and, and how to become healthy again. And sometimes you almost forget that you can feel, you can change how you feel by just watching what you eat. <laughs> sometimes it can be easy to forget. Um, and so I think it's a really important aspect, um, to be looking at all of these different components. And, um, so one of our, what we think is the most important, um, best for last room in the house is the bedroom. And this is where our bodies are going to heal and repair every single night. And so if you, if you can't do anything anywhere in your home, this is the room that I would recommend starting in. If you have the budget to, um, you know, get new furniture or do renovations or just if you can only put money in one place of the home, I suggest starting here um, because this room is somewhere we are going to be spending most of our time. And again, it's where our bodies are regenerating every single night. So we're going to go through some of the main things that you can look at in your bedroom. Amanda, do you want to chat a little bit about mattresses and pillows and linens? Yeah. So we kind of chatted about that earlier. Um, we're spending uh, eight plus hours every night on our pillow, on our mattress, breathing in what those materials are made of. Um, so again, just choosing natural materials versus petroleum or man-made products, um, looking for, you know, the fire retardants that are added onto there, um, just being conscious of what, what you're using for your um, linens, your pillow covers, your bedding, and then of course the mattress itself. Um, we mentioned the certification to look for is Okotex. And am I pronouncing that right, Ashley? Is it Okotex? Yeah, Okotex, yep. Okotex, okay, I yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it's they have it like at Target now even. I know West Elm has it. Um, so uh, on the topic of natural materials, we chatted about choosing um, things that are, are found in nature. So cotton, cotton's one of them. Um, however, here we go with the organic. You need to make sure it's organic because cotton is often sprayed uh, heavily with pesticides. So choosing natural organic materials, um, yeah. super important. That is where you're, you know, spending, uh, some people say the majority of your life is on your, yeah. on your bed. Yeah. And to add to that too, um, you know, finding things like wool, which are natural flame retardants, um, are going to limit the need to have flame retardants in the actual mattress itself. Um, something else I want to share on the bed is just making sure that you have ample ventilation, um, above and below the bed. Um, when we sleep, we sweat, um, moisture gets into our bed and even natural materials and natural latex mattresses have been found to have mold. And oftentimes this can be due to the fact that there's just not enough ventilation um, below the mattress, it, mattress itself. You know, using um, slats and keeping it clear underneath of the bed, it's going to be a really um, good way to promote ventilation under there, making sure you're, you're um, the other thing is to 
after you're done sleeping at night, you know, the rule is always in my house that you have to make the bed as soon as you wake up. Um, but actually what we're doing when we're making the bed, as soon as we wake up is we're trapping all of the heat and moisture from when we slept into the mattress. So what I've learned as I've, you know, done a lot of training in building biology is a better way is to actually roll the, um, cover down to the foot of the bed and let it have some sunlight, which is going to help with dust mites, going to help it dry out. It's going to provide ventilation. Sunlight is a natural antimicrobial. It's going to allow the mattress to breathe um, and then come back in a few hours. And then you can make your bed once it's been cooled down. So that's another really helpful tip. Um, and making sure that you're vacuuming your bed regularly when you're doing your sheets and, um, you know, washing your sheets at least once a week, um, because we have dead skin cells and dust mites love dead skin cells. And, you know, this is again, where we are sleeping every single night. So keeping the bed itself super clean, um, is really important and understanding if you need to rotate your bed so that you can keep it, um, you know, extend the life of the bed, um, from getting divots and also touching on beds. If you can find something that doesn't have coils in it, um, that's an added bonus because the coils can become magnetized and, um, there's different studies showing different health, um, effects from sleeping on magnetized coils. Um, you know, there's other, some other people who say that the metal coils can act as an antenna attracting different electric fields as well. So, um, if you can find one, um, you know, getting something that's as natural as possible is going to be the number one, but if you can also find something that is uh, coil free, that's going to be again, an added bonus to finding a healthy mattress. I love that. A lot of this really is unlearning what we've learned our entire life and kind yeah. of changing the way, you know, the way we, uh, used to do things. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I guess I can just jump into the carpets a little bit more too. Um, and because we talked about carpets earlier, so we don't need to touch on this too much. Um, but if you do have carpets in your bedroom, um, which a lot of people do, I know that it's something that I have in my bedroom, which I don't love because carpets are reservoirs for dust and they're really, really, really hard to clean. Um, you have to, I think there was a study done that you have to vacuum the carpet 14 times back and forth and cross sections, even to make a dent in um, cleaning it. So if you do have carpet or rugs in your bedroom, making sure you're over vacuuming, even if it looks clean from the surface, give it that extra couple back and forths to make sure that you're getting, um, whatever's caught inside the reservoir out because as we were walking on our carpets, we're kicking and stirring that stuff up, which can become respirable in our breathing zone. Um, and you know, if you're looking at rugs and that kind of thing, again, looking for natural materials, avoiding the synthetic carpets, um, are going to be really key to that. Um, and then jumping quickly into EMFs, um, I think that EMFs are a really important component in our bedroom. Not only, you know, this, this topic can be really overwhelming for people. And I, I just want to touch on it briefly, because I know at the beginning of my journey, when my practitioner told me um, to avoid EMFs, I kind of looked at her with a blank stare, like, what do you mean? And it took me a really long time to get where I'm at. So do not be overwhelmed by this. But the first thing I would say is make your bedroom a technology free zone, remove the cell phones, remove the computers, remove the tablets. Again, these things can influence our circadian rhythm. They have blue light in them. We talked about that earlier. Um, but if we can also unplug any devices that are plugged into the walls, that's also going to really, really help reduce the amount of electric fields in that we're being exposed to in our bedrooms. I'm not going to go too, too deep into that today, but, um, just know that if you can, if you have TVs or you have lamps or things plugged in, is there something that you can actually unplug to make your room a little bit less, um, you know, a little bit less about tech and more about becoming a sleep sanctuary. Um, and then Amanda, if you want to jump into 
um, you know, circadian rhythm in the, in the light flicker a little bit? Sure. So we've kind of, um, talked about blue light a lot, but not exactly, you know, the reasoning behind it. So our bodies have a natural sleep wake cycle and, you know, as the sun rises, it's what's warm colors, um, sending signals to our brain through our eyes that it's time to wake up and get energized throughout the day. Um, light bulbs are eventually going to be designed to mimic that of the sun. But until we're there, it's important to kind of set up your home um, for circadian rhythm any way that you need to. So what I do is, um, you know, I personally wake up and watch the sunrise. That tells us uh, the day has started, you know, get you get filled with energy. Um, as the day goes on, um, after dark, no more blue light because the sun is sending blue light into your eye saying, wake up, wake up, let's go. So that's why it's so important to not use your computer, not watch your TV, not go on your tablet at night because that's sending signals to your brain to wake up. Um, so I have incandescent bulbs and after the sun goes down, um, they're not incandescent, I'm sorry, they're vintage filament. So they're they're very warm in color. After the sun goes down, no more blue light. Um, Ashley, you brought up opening up the fridge, like all yeah. these little things are um, our time on our microwaves and our stoves and all of that is this blue light. So important to make sure that you're not exposing yourself to that in the evening so that you get good sleep because sleep is mm -hmm. when our bodies clean ourselves. It's when we rest. It's um, the only time really that we, and, you know, unless we're fasting, that we are, are cleansing and getting ready for um the day, as far as Flickr goes, I think you might know a little bit more about Flickr than I do if you want to chat about that. Yeah. So um, in addition to finding bulbs that are lower in blue light, um, like an incandescent bulb is going to be a full spectrum light. So it's going to be warmer in color, but those are kind of getting tossed as we move into a new age of energy efficiency. Um, LED lights are becoming the norm. And they very much are the norm. Um, but there are some companies that are making um, blue light free or full spectrum LED bulbs that are also low flicker. So flicker is hard. You can barely detect it with your human eye. Like you, you can't even sometimes, you know, I think of a fluorescent light flickering and that's like a very detectable level of flicker. But even the lights, LED lights in my home, um, because I wasn't the one who selected these lights. Um, if you video them on slow-mo on your phone, you can actually see that there is an insane amount of flicker. The, the, there's just a pulsing. So um, if you can, uh, you know, in your lamps or whatever in your bedroom or in your decorative lighting or ambient lighting, you know, after dark, put a bulb in these different fixtures that actually are flicker free. That's really going to help you. Um, because what will happen is your pupil will actually expand and contract with that flicker, even though you don't realize it's happening and it can create head headaches and dizziness and to extreme situations, seizures. Mm -hmm. So flicker is really, really important component and again, like I said, the one way you can see if your lights are actually flickering is to do with the slow-mo video of them. And if they are, you can look to companies like um, Bond Charge, for instance, um, they used to be blue, bo blue blocks. Um, they have a flicker-free full spectrum LED light that you can use. And we just have them in all of our lamps. So after the sun goes down, no more LED lights. We are only using um, lamps and um, pendants in the home that have these uh, bulbs in them. So we know that we're not a, not getting flickering lights, but B we're also avoiding as much blue light as possible during those hours. Um, and this is all can be super, super overwhelming. And I just want to stress the fact that none of this happens overnight. Um, it took me personally years, I think over a span of seven years, I've been implementing these different changes and um, it's just every small step is a success and an improvement to your overall well-being. So we actually did create a little um checklist that we think, you know, 
can help you on your journey to starting um, and implementing all of these things, um, you know, and it's really just bringing more awareness into your everyday. It doesn't mean you have to do it right away. You know, it's, it can be expensive to change out all these things and do all these things, but as you're done using one product and you need to buy it again, can you buy it again as a better version of what it was? Um, whether it's a better foundation beauty product or cleaning product, or you need a new mattress or you need new sheets or, you're replacing the carpet in your house, you know, whatever that is, it's, it's just take small steps. It happens in small, small changes. So I hope that that can, you know, help you not feel as overwhelmed. Yeah. I love this list. I think it's just a great place to start and it's super empowering. Um, like Ashley said, everything that we discussed is probably overwhelming and you know, you don't want to flip your entire world over at once, but this is just a great checklist to feel empowered and to start making healthier choices in every asset of your home. Yeah, I, I love that. And I love too that, you know, you can start with a room, right? You don't have to tear everything down in the whole house and start all over. So your focus might be the bedroom, like you said. Um, and then, and then maybe you move on when you're ready financially or mentally, emotionally, whatever, to move on to your kitchen or you could even start with, with some of these things on this list, because there's some of these things that you could do right now, like the no shoe rule and, um, filtering your water could be done pretty quickly and, and things like that. So I love this. Yeah. And yeah, tell us how we can connect with you. Like if, if people wanted more information, I know you ladies are a wealth of information. How can they reach out to you? Yeah. Um, you can always come find, um, I think both of us on Instagram, I'm at awakening spaces on Instagram. I'm always checking in, answering DMS there. Um, if you are renovating or building new or needing support, um, with your interiors, uh, you can always reach out at hello at awakening spaces and we can see how we can support you. Um, or if you just want to stop in and say, hi, you can email hello at awakening spaces.com. How about you, Amanda? Yeah, so I'm on Instagram. I'm at Keto Canary. Um, Keto Canary at gmail.com is my email address. Um, but I'm super happy to help. And I've been through my own struggles. And I really have found um, changing simple things and changing what you eat and the products that you use is, um, is key to getting your health back or just staying on a healthy path. So super happy to connect. I know we both are. Thank you so much for all this, because it, it really is about um, providing these like manageable, actionable steps for people. We know it's a big, um, overwhelming process and it doesn't need to be. So, you know, meet yourself where you're at and go from there. Um, is it all right? Are we going to be able to make the your slideshow downloadable for our viewers? Yes, awesome. We'll make sure on our website, um, depending on where you're viewing this, but we'll definitely have it on our website where the the article will be, um, an interview will be hosted that you can download it because um, I know for me, I want to go back and take a closer look at that checklist for sure. So ladies, once again, thank you so much for being here. Are there any parting or final thoughts you want to leave us with? Um, no, just thank you so much for having us. And yeah, again, we can't stress enough that if you're going through this journey and you're overwhelmed and you want support, um, we are here to help and um, don't hesitate to re reach out, even if you just want to chat with somebody who's been down the road. <laughs> um, you know, that's one of my favorite things about Awakening Spaces is just connecting with like-minded people. So um, don't hesitate to reach out to either of us and just know it's a process. Yeah, this is sorry, no. this is super great. I was just I'm really happy that we did this. And um yeah, we are happy to even just chat. I mean, we've both been through our own struggles. Yeah. It's it's always you can always tell when somebody has um you know, when their passion is fueled by personal experience, right? Because there's um, that that empathy there and that care. So for everyone listening, thank you so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this interview, do me a favor and head on over to changetheairfoundation.org and sign up for our newsletter because it really is the best way to get information and tips like this directly to your inbox. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.